Thanks for coming. This is Microsoft Excel 101. Um, Check out your laptop. Right. Thanks for coming. This is Entrepreneur's Roundtable 115. Does anybody know what 115 is? Is it like a random number or? Exactly, number of events we've done so far. This is the 115th event. And we actually started 10 years ago. And here's the story. Like, first meeting, uh, just a bunch of entrepreneurs around the round table. Second meeting, Albert Wenger from Unisquare Ventures joined. And in the second meeting, Albert said to me, oh, you should invite my friend, Gil Beta. So Gil was in Entrepreneurs Roundtable 3. And then you're in like, I don't know, like 25, something, something. And now it's great to have him back for 115. I'm very excited. So Gil actually uh, like started and sold many large businesses. So he has great experience and he's been investing. A uh, great person to know. And tonight we'll get to know more about his background, how he got here, and more importantly, what he invests in, what he is looking for. And as always, uh, he has a bag somewhere full of cash. Yeah, I always have that. So yeah, he's going to throw cash at you if he likes your pitch. So we have five startups that we picked. I'm very excited about them. They're going to come here and pitch to Gil, and Gil will give them feedback. Then, at the end, uh, if there's time, we are going to pick randomly, not randomly, with questions, one more startup to come up here and pitch. So, just uh, who here would be very brave enough to come up here and pitch at the end, willing to pitch? Great, I love it. Just think, but it's going to be a great chance. So, we'll start with Gil's background introduction. By the way, uh, thanks to Microsoft for hosting us, I think it's been four years. Is anyone from Microsoft here? Do you have any friends at Microsoft? <laughs> Tell them I said thank you. Thank you. And also uh, tonight, um, yeah, so after the introduction, we'll do a QA. You can ask Gil specific questions. I think uh, you, like on Twitter, you said, come talk to me about blockchain. So, yeah, feel free. Yeah. After that, you have the pitches. After the pitches, uh, we'll pick one more company. And after that, we'll hang out here a little bit. And then we'll go across the street. Some of some people for a couple of drinks, or maybe like ten, or one, or zero. <laughs> so uh, thanks for coming again, and I'm very excited to introduce Gil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Murat. Um, I really appreciate the invitations. You always have an awesome crowd here. Um, can't wait to pick up my check right as I walk out for all the admission, the admission fees. Uh, so, you know, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, a little bit about my background is I was a technologist for about 10 years um, and uh, was a so software engineer and wrote code. Uh, and uh, as some of our friends know, I, I lived in Brussels, I lived in Hong Kong for a while. Uh, and then in about 1995, I started my first company, was founder CTO of a company called Real Media, which is in the advertising technology space. Uh, Real Media was acquired in 01. Then I jumped on board with my co-founder again uh, in a company called Dakota, then the ad tech space, which sold in 07. Uh, and then uh, I jumped on board with Comcast. So, so, so in addition to being CTO at, uh, um, at Dakota, I was also head of corp dev, ran our fundraising process, which we didn't end up taking. Uh, and uh, so we got acquired, met the, you know, through that process, met the Comcast Ventures guys. At the time, and this was like, you know, 07, 08, they weren't doing any early stage seed investing. So we decided to form a fund together called Genicast. Uh, so Genicast, uh, I've been running Genicast for almost 10 years now. Uh, it's a seed stage fund. Uh, that invests up to a million dollars in early stage, primarily B2B tech companies based in the Northeast. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you about you know, all the wonderful companies we invested in, maybe some of the not so wonderful. Um, and then also last year, in addition to doing Genicast, the million dollar checks through Genicast, 
Um, I joined Comcast Ventures as a, um, as a partner to do the two to 20 million size investment. Uh, so now I can write the $1 million checks and up to the, the, the $20 million checks. So you know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit to, you know, tonight about sort of the, the types of companies that I find interesting, um, what sort of the process that I go through in investing and how do I, how do I pick a company. Uh, and then maybe talk to you a little bit about some of the portfolio companies that I've invested in, some that have done well, maybe some that haven't done so, so, so well. Uh, so just to give you a little perspective on my day to day, you know, last year at Genicast, we saw 700 deals. Um, and we met with probably 50% of those companies, so you know, 350 companies. Um, out of those companies, we invested in one. So one is not a typical year. Uh, sometimes we invest up to three. Sometimes we invest zero. So the good news there is there are only two investors in the fund in Genicast. So I'm an investor in the fund personally, and Comcast is an investor in the fund. It's a little unique fund in that we don't have typical LPs. So, so um, it's an evergreen fund, and we can be patient. Uh, so some years where there are, we see a lot of exciting companies, we can write a bunch of checks, and in some years where you know, we don't see any interesting companies, we don't have to, to write a check. So we're, we're very particular, and we have to really be in love with the company um, in order to make an investment. So how do we fall in love with the company? So first off, it starts off with a great introduction. Uh, you know, I, I receive you know, a lot of emails um, from info at genicast.com or hello at genicast.com or whatever we keep changing it you know so that you know the spam box don't find it but but uh, those are probably the most difficult introductions because there's no connection with the company and basically a company that just emails me uh, there there's no filtering going on there's no um, uh, th there's no criteria that have been you know, you know, put on that company, then there's no way for me to immediately, without even reading the company, know that you know, there's, there's potential in this company, that, that it could be interesting. If it's introduced to me through a you know, service provider, like lawyer, accountant, what have you, through a net, my network, um, through entrepreneurs I funded, even better, right? they usually do at least a minimum level of diligence. Oh, these guys you know, are, uh, are real, or you know, they have a deck, or you know, they, they know how to pitch, or I don't, whatever that at least minimum criteria is. Uh, maybe they met with the company and it's a little bit higher. Maybe they know the company, maybe they're working with the company. And so at least there's a level of uh, uh, diligence, so the bar has been raised a little bit, and so that's why those companies are a little bit more interesting. So, you know, number one is try to get an intro. I don't, you know, I am readily available. I come to events like this. I have a vast network uh, in in this area. Everybody here is probably one step away from from getting in contact with me, and probably you all know Marat. And you know, if Marat emails me, I will definitely look at that at, at that company. So there you go. That's what you get for, for inviting me, because you get a bunch of spam tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so you know, the second thing that we look at is uh, the team. You know, a, a lot of people say that that oh, we got to have a good team. But what does it mean to have a good team? For me, I like to. Or paraphrase Thomas Edison when he said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I think a startup is much the same in that it's 1% a good idea and 99% perspiration, it's execution. So the first thing I look at is can this team, does, does this team have the makeup? Do they have the experience? Do they have the network in order to execute this company? I mean, we all have great ideas. I have great ideas all the time. You know, things that I absolutely have no ability to execute. And the difference between me and a real company is somebody who can take an idea and who can execute 
that, that idea. And for each company, it's different. For spaces that require a lot of domain expertise, uh, are there specialized spaces? I'd like to know, you know, to, to know that the team either comes from that space or they know the space really well, or you know, they operate a business in that space or something. Uh, for other businesses where they're disrupting the status quo, maybe it's less important that they understand the existing business models and relationships because they're going to blow it all up. Uh, but it's important that the team not only has a vision for the company, but also has a vision to execute uh, the company. And we also look at, of course, we look at the idea. Like, what are they building here? Um, we look at uh, uh, you know, I, you know, given that I have a technology background, I like to see companies that have interesting technology. They're solving a hard problem uh, using hard technology. Right? There are very few opportunities that companies have for building defensibility, competitive advantages. And so one way is by solving a really hard problem and doing it in a different way uh, than the traditional players. So we'll look at you know, what problem are you solving? How are you solving that? Is there some defensibility? And what are the competitive advantages that you have to solving that problem? Uh, and then we'll also look at the competitive landscape. So, so how are people solving that problem today? Is it a new problem? Is it a problem that people don't know that they have, so you have to educate them and then you <laughs> solve a solution? Um, or is it a, a problem today and People need a solution, but existing solutions just don't work. Um, and oftentimes, paper and pencil or Excel is you know, uh, you know, the, the competition. And it's important to understand and not minimize the difficulty that people have for moving a, to an, from an existing solution to a problem to, to a, a, a new solution. Uh, so we look at the competitive landscape. And then we look at uh, uh, some, of the, some of the sort of in intricate workings of the company, right? So how much money do they need? How much runway does that give them? What are the milestones that they're looking to hit? So very sort of kind of tactical things. Okay, you're asking for a you know, million dollars or two million dollars or half a million dollars, whatever the amount is. You know, how is the company going to use the money? Do, do they have a good plan? You know, what's their hiring plan? What is their projected customer acquisition? And, and by the way, this is all around more B2B enterprise type companies, which is what I focus on. Uh, the consumer type companies, there are a lot of other different things that you look at there, and it's not my specialty, so I'm probably not the guy to, you know, to comment on those, uh, those types of companies. Um, but the, uh, uh, so, so we look at you know, their financial model, their hiring plan. So we want to understand the connection between, okay, we give you the cash, and now what are you going to do with that? How is that going to accelerate your business? How is it going to allow you to hit those milestones? And whatever those milestones are, right? So in some cases, the problem you're solving, the technological problem you're solving, is really difficult. So there's a high risk on the technology. So maybe for some companies, the only thing you're going to do on a million bucks is show that you can build a solution to solve the problem. Right? In other cases, the it's not the technology, it's customer acquisition. It's like how do we find these customers? So maybe the milestone is around acquiring customers or acquiring customers at a particular cost. Um, or it's around revenue. Yeah, you can find those customers, but Nobody's really going to pay a lot for the solution. So maybe the risk there is around how much will they pay. Uh, so in that case, you want to look at, um, so you know, what, what, what are the assumptions you made about the company to be successful? To, and, and then you're trying to de-risk the business. You're trying to prove those assumptions. That you can build the technology. You can go to market. You can get customers. You can get them to, uh, to pay. Um, and these days, Series A investors, which are the investors after the seed, they are raising the bar because there are a lot more companies that are getting funded at the seed stage. And so the Series A guys, they can be a lot more choosy and they can wait. Uh, 
um, and wait for you to get more revenue, more customers, more whatever. Um, and, and then sort of the, the, the final question that we ask is really around you know, what is the exit potential for this company? So you're creating a lot of value, which is awesome, and you're probably making a lot of customers happy, and, and you're employing a lot of people, all great things, but our model is based upon there being an exit. And most likely it's not an IPO. There are a small number of companies that, that IPO that even have the capability of, of uh, um, being a multi-hundred million, billion dollar company and, and IPO. So we're looking at more rational strategies or more probable strategies around, okay, you're creating a valuable asset, but to whom will it be valuable? Who will be the acquirer? Who will be the company that says, I need this team, or I need this technology, or I need your customers, or I need product to put into my existing pipeline, or this is a space that I need to expand into. And you know, for, for a team that knows their space, uh, they should be able to come up with a <coughs> dozen, a half dozen different potential acquirers. Um, you know, companies that are in the space, around the space, want to be in the space, um, are being disrupted by the space, and, you know, have cash, have done acquisitions before. So it's important in our model that there is an exit. And by no means, it's, you know, it's not something that we want the company to focus on. It's not a, one of the top priorities that, that a company, as they're executing the business, they have to think about, okay, am I going to, I want to build this business to be acquired by this company here. No, that's not the purpose of it. Uh, the purpose of it is just to understand what type of business are we building here. And some businesses won't get acquired, and it and, and will be a great company and, and, and will could throw off millions of dollars in cash and you can have another house and a car and an airplane.